Dr. Philip Stieg, Professor and Chairman, Department of Neurological Surgery, Weill Cornell Medicine, Neurosurgeon-in-Chief, New York Presbyterian Hospital. And if somebody wants to find out more about this, do you have a website that you would suggest they go to? Sure, they can come to wildcornellbrainandspine.org, and uh, in that you just type in slash uh, IIH, and there will be a, a tremendous amount of information in our website, and it will also guide you to other websites. Talking this morning with uh, Dr. Philip Stieg about IIH, what is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, that's a mouthful. And then the other name that's really uh, confusing is it's, it used to be known as what's called pseudotumor cerebri. And it's a uh, becoming, unfortunately, a more common problem where more commonly women will have a rise in the pressure within their brain and that translates into certain neurologic problems and the ones that we worry most about are loss of vision. It, it affects women 20 to 50, women that are, are obese uh, and with, as I said, the rising incidence of obesity in America, it's becoming a much more common problem affecting up to 21 per 100,000 people mm -hmm. in the age group of 15 to 45. Talk about the uh, symptoms of IIH, if you would. You mentioned blindness. Well, patients are going to come in. M most commonly, they will start with headache. The, the neurologist will work them up. They'll get a CT scan or an MRI scan that shows that the fluid chambers within their brain are normal in size. But then they eventually will start complaining about worsening vision. And over a long period of time, then that pressure that is building up within the brain is transmitted to the optic nerve, your vision nerve, which is connected to the brain. And when the doctor looks in your eye, they can see some changes in the optic nerve. And immediately their attention would be drawn towards the diagnosis of idiopathic intracranial hypertension or pseudotumor cerebri. Vision loss and headache are the mm -hmm. two major things that the, the patients are going to complain about. And maybe tinnitus. You know, it's a ringing or a whooshing sound in their ears. I was just going to ask about that. Is it believed that uh, obesity does play a role in causing IIH? They, they certainly seem to be linked. You know, mm -hmm. uh, this is much more common. It only occurs in about five percent of men, and obviously, we know that there's a, an increasing obesity component in the male population as well. So, there are obviously other factors that play a role in the development of this disease. I think one thing that we can talk about is. is birth control pills. Birth control pills have an impact on your blood coagulation. And as we're going to talk about, one of the treatments for this disease is blood clots forming within one of the major draining veins of your brain. And if we treat that, we end up treating your IIH. You are now using a new non-invasive treatment for IIH. It's called venous sinus stenting. Yeah. Minimally invasive. Basically, yeah. what, what the process is, number one, we make the diagnosis, and you can make the diagnosis uh, on the basis of an MR angiogram slash MR venogram. And we can see that there is altered flow in a particular sinus, a venous sinus of your brain called the sigmoid sinus. And that's that sits right behind your ear. And when we look at the MRA, uh, the MR angiogram, we can see that there's altered flow within that, that venous cavity. In the patient then that has the signs of the idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which is headache and visual loss, and they have failed medical management, there are some medicines called Diamox that have been tried. Uh, we can also do lumbar punctures to see whether the patient gets better. Those things help in making the diagnosis. If there is some improvement, it certainly indicates that that's the disease that you have. And eventually they work their way up to undergoing this process, which is an angiogram. And so uh, you come to our uh, angiography suite and a little puncture site is made in your groin. And then the uh, small little rubber tube, it's called a microcatheter, is fed up into this vein of your uh, brain and we're able to put what's called a stent, much like what everybody knows about coronary stenting and carotid stenting. It's the same kind of process where we put this stent in this vein, and we've had tremendous 
good fortune with treating this, and we're hoping to start a uh, national trial. You make it sound easy, because you've probably done a lot of these, but it sounds a little risky, is it? Well, yeah, let's let's look to take it, put it in perspective. Uh, <laughs> the patient that fails medical management, if we weren't able to do this, the other options surgically would be to put in a, it's called a, a, a shunt, where we put a rubber tube down through your brain into the fluid chambers and tunnel that under the skin, and it, it drops the fluid from your brain into the belly where it gets reabsorbed by your intestines. Hmm. That's an invasive procedure where we have to blindly stick something into your brain. Another option is for us to go in and drill off the bone around your optic nerve, both of which are more invasive uh, than putting in this stent. And again, this is one of these things, yes, it's easy in competent hands, but uh, it, it, it's, it's relatively ro- low risk. I, when you come and talk with our endovascular surgeons, they will tell you, give you maybe a 1% or 2% risk of failure. So it's in the scope of things, yes, it's serious. Yes, we're manipulating around your brain. We understand that, but, but overall, the risk is low. Is this treatment widely available yet? Widely, I would not say yes to. I think that uh, you know, it, it's certainly becoming more accessible as people are learning about our success with this. Uh, like I said, there hasn't been a large-scale clinical trial on a national basis. Uh, I would like to get Dr. Pozzolides, who uh, created this uh, treatment paradigm, uh, to start running that type of a trial so we can show that it's of benefit to these people that really it's a miserable life. I mean, Mm -hmm. if you can imagine chronic headaches, loss of vision uh, on top of the obesity problem, it makes your life pretty miserable. If a person would uh, uh, lose significant amounts of weight, would uh, this reverse uh, IIH? It's been shown to be helpful. Uh, the, uh, the medical management that I referred to earlier is, yes, weight reduction, certainly making sure that the patient is not on any medications that induce blood clotting. Uh, 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 and, uh, you know, then we can also try the medications, like I said, Diamoct, which has this, it basically reduces the production of brain water. So there's lower incidence of or a lower amount of water and thereby the headaches are going to be reduced and the pressure is reduced. What about the side effects from venous sinus stenting? There really are none. Again, it's very much like uh, the, the coronary stents. I mean, how many? You, I'm sure you know hundreds of people that have had mm-hmm. stents put in their coronary arteries, and they're walking around fine. I mean, it is, it's a transformative therapy that uh, carries, if done well, done safely in competent hands, carries a very low risk. I was going to ask earlier how severe the symptoms have to be before it's wise to seek an expert, but it sounds to me like it's difficult to even live with those symptoms for long. You would almost be forced to see an expert. Yeah, the headaches are pretty unbearable. Uh, And then if a person fits the profile, we're certainly going to start looking for the, uh, the blood clot in the sinus. I mean, clearly headaches are more common than idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Um, that being said, if you fit the profile of being obese in, in the fertile ages and female, uh, and if on top of the headaches you're complaining about visual symptomatology, our antennas go up pretty quickly. After the stenting procedure, doctor, would uh, IIH recur? It's In our experience, we haven't had any trouble. I mean, the patient is put on some mild blood thinners after the stent is in place. Mm. And again, fortunately, we haven't uh, in, in treating, I think we've treated over 90 patients now. The uh, results have been superb. Any uh, success stories really stand out from those 90 who you've treated? I think an example of, you know, we talked earlier about the uh, 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 the association also with uh, the whooshing sound in the ears. Uh, we had one patient who actually was a hospital administrator and presented to us with incapacitating, you know, sound whooshing in her ears to the point that she was unable to work. Uh, this is again similar to and like the IIH. It, the cause of it can be the same, and we did the MR scan that showed that she had clot within. Uh, that area of her venous drainage, we put a stent in, and boom, it was gone. 
So it was a, a, an immediate resolution. And, you know, that is also similar uh, uh, in the uh, patients that have IIH. The headaches resolve uh, almost instantly. The, the visual symptoms, if there's been damage to the optic nerves, take a little bit of time to resolve. And, and there may be permanent deficit depending upon how long the patient or how late the patient gets to us. You've been fascinating as you always are. Anything else you'd like to add about this topic? Uh, I think that covers it. I think that, yeah, again, if, if you just get it out there, if patients want to find out about this, they can go to Wild Cornell Brain and Spine, all one word, dot org slash IIH dash paper, dash paper.